Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today uh, for our webinar launch of the joint report between the International Longevity Center UK and the Royal College of Design. Um, I'm sorry, the Royal College of Art Design Age Institute, uh, which is titled Money Well Spent, Overcoming Barriers to Spending in Later Life. My name is Carly Dixon. I'm a Knowledge Exchange Fellow at the Design Age Institute, and I'm very happy to be moderating the panel dis discussion today that will follow the presentation of the report. So before we jump in, just a few housekeeping items that we'll be recording this webinar session, and we'll be posting that to our websites following the session, and you should get a link as well. Um, and we'll be taking questions from the audience via the Q&A box at the bottom. So feel free to post your questions in there at any time during the session. And we will be um, taking, keeping an eye on that and ask those questions towards the end of the session. Um, and the, the question that we're discussing today is how we want to spend our time and our money in later life. This is a question that we at Design Age Institute have been keen to better understand. So our mission is to use design to help people have healthier and happier later lives. And that's why it's critical for us to understand the barriers that people face that stop them from spending their time and their money how they would like to. We've been really fortunate to collaborate with ILC on this topic, who have been studying the impact of longevity on society since they were established in 1997. And to quote from the report, the aim is not to promote consumption for the sake of it, particularly in the context of growing environmental concerns, but rather we want to understand the barriers preventing older people from spending in the way they would like, especially on items and experiences that benefit their health. In this way, we can identify practical ways for designers and policymakers to address these barriers to ensure a growing consumer base isn't excluded from participating fully in the economy and in society. So with that in mind, I'm pleased to introduce the author of the report, Dr. Vivian Burroughs, Vivian joined the ILC in December 2022 as a senior research fellow. Before this, she worked as an associate professor in economics at the University of Reading. Vivian has a PhD in economics from the University of York, which she completed in 2012. Vivian has a particular interest in household financial decision making and financial well being, and how wealth transfers between family members affect the accumulation of wealth and wealth inequalities. She's also interested in the causes behind the differences in retirement income between men and women and how this gender pension gap has evolved over time. Her recent work includes a book chapter on families, housing, and economic security, and a participatory research project exploring the impact of young onset dementia on financial well-being. Vivian has also been working on a textbook on the economics of the public sector for Oxford University Press, which includes Sorry, includes um, dedicated chapters on healthcare, aging, and pensions. So, Vivian, over to you. Thank you very much, Carly, um, and thank you, everyone, or to everyone who's um, listening in on the webinar today. Um, so, I will just um, pull up the slides for the presentation. Uh, okay. Uh, so, yes, as Carly said the focus of this project is on um, understanding the barriers uh, to spending in later life. So we know that spending tends to fall as we age. Um, and what we wanted to do with this project was to try and understand why that happens and what some of the key barriers that, um, that people face are um, and that prevent them from spending their time and money in the way that they'd like to. Now, the project itself is the outcome of, um, so we ran a nationally representative survey of about 1,000 adults aged 60 and over in the UK. Um, and we also carried out some more in-depth interviews with a smaller sample of individuals. And it's on these sort of two bits of evidence that the report is based. So um, what I'm going to do in this presentation is just sort of highlight some of the key findings from our report. Um, now, we found that there are significant barriers to spending in later life. So 70 72% of people that we surveyed uh, felt that they were not spending their time and money in the way that they would like to. And in general, uh, they seemed to favor or spending on experiences, whether it was time or money, seemed to be more important than spending on goods. So some of the top things that people identified when asked um, about the sorts of things that they'd like to do more of or spend more money on 
Uh, top things included holidays, um, things like going out for, for food or coffee, uh, visiting friends and family, um, and participating in recreation and leisure activities. Um, and it was in these areas that sort of the barriers to spending seemed to be more um, prevalent as well, although they were also we also found significant barriers preventing people from doing from sort of spending um, on on sort of, um, on the goods and products that they would like to as well. Uh, so the key question is, well, what are some of these barriers? And the quotes here from some of our interview participants um, illustrate some of the key issues. So financial barriers or financial concerns came out quite a lot. Um, so whether this was about uh, being on a tight budget, not having enough money, um, but also being worried about needing to save money to pay for potential future health care or care costs were important. Um, but our interviews also highlighted other barriers, um, in particular barriers related to people's social networks. So the lack of or not having enough people to do things with was also a significant barrier preventing people from um, spending their time and money in the, in the way that they'd like to. Um, so in our survey, we basically, well, we designed a survey building on the insights we got from these interviews and we identified three main categories of barriers. Um, the first is about making money last. And in our survey, we found that by far the most important barrier to spending in later life had to do with financial concerns. Um, and this was not only about being on a tight budget or not having enough money today, which is probably unsurprising given um, the current cost of living crisis, uh, but one in three people were also worried about needing the money in the future. So this uncertainty over how much money they would need in the future and how much money they would have in the future was acting as a significant barrier to spending today. Um, so some of the sort of future spending concerns here evolved around um, uh, potential future care and healthcare costs, um, but also the potential need to spend on housing adaptations to sort of make their homes more um, suitable, more accommodating for, <clears throat> for themselves as they, um, or, or for us as we grow older. Another set of barriers had to do with access and accessibility. So just over half of our survey respondents felt that they had difficulty getting to and around places. And this acted as a barrier to their, <clears throat> to spending. Um, and some of the key, <coughs> sorry, some of the key issues identified here had to do with um, transport. So whether this was the lack of parking or expensive parking, issues around public transport, so the cost of public transport, um, the unreliability of public transport, but also in some cases, the lack of um, viable public transport options. Um, there were also access barriers related to the, the facilities available, in particular, the lack of public toilets, um, and the lack of places to sit and have a rest on our high streets. Um, and then some barriers to do with, um, I guess, the sort of accessibility of uh, town centres. So um, how cluttered or uneven, in, uneven pavement surfaces can be um, and so on. And lastly, we looked at barriers relating to the shopping experience itself, both offline and online. And here we found that 59% of the people we surveyed were dissatisfied with some aspect of the shop's products and hospitality settings on offer. Um, and some of the sort of the, the key issues identified here had to do with um, well, self-service checkouts or the dislike of self-service checkouts was quite a big one. Um, but there were also issues around the facilities in shops, so the lack of toilets or lack of accessible toilets within shops um, or difficulty finding toilets lack of places to sit and rest, um, how noisy and busy some shopping environments are could also act as a deterrent um, to some of the individuals we surveyed. Uh, we also looked at experiences and barriers uh, faced in online shopping. Um, and here I think it's quite interesting because even though we carried out this survey online, we found that 50% of the people surveyed still didn't feel they shopped online as much as they would like to. Um, and part of this had to do with, um, I guess, the way that online shopping works, the way it's quite or feels quite impersonal, the lack of human interaction. Um, but part of it was also related to concerns about um, online scams and fraud, 
um, issues around the quality of products. So when you're buying things online, it's harder to, to get a, a clear sense of, of what the products you're buying are like and, and whether the description is accurate. Um, and also issues around the hassle of returning items. So these were the main barriers that we looked at. And the key question then is, well, what can we do about them? Uh, now to address barriers, uh, to, to address some of the financial barriers, I think the key is really to work more in supporting financial security in later life. And this includes ensuring that everyone has access to affordable and accessible expert financial advice in later life to help them plan and manage their finances as they grow older. But there's also scope to um, invest in or to design in new uh, financial products. So one of the key issues that came out from the survey was this worry about running out of money as we grow older. And this is why um, we tend to save rather than spend, or one of the reasons why we tend to save rather than spend. Um, and it's perhaps unsurprising given that you know, most of us, we don't know how long we're going to live for. We don't always know exactly what our income, our future income is going to be. We don't know what our future expenditure needs are going to be. And all of this uncertainty makes planning very difficult. And this is where um, well-designed financial products have an important role to play. Um, now, we do have products like annuities, which provide a guaranteed income stream in retirement. Um, these have fallen out of favour somewhat. Um, and while they might be suitable for some individuals, they might not be appropriate for everyone. So it's important that the financial services industry thinks about what sort of products could we be developing to better support individuals' um, consumption during retirement and help with this financial planning. Um, and related to this, there's also the issue of the uh, sort of our expected future expenditure, so the uncertainty we face on whether it's care or healthcare costs. And this is where uh, we feel that the government could sort of take a more um, active steps to provide more certainty on future care costs to help people's um, financial planning in, in later life. And of course, financial security in later life is also about where we live, our homes. And this is where design cost awareness has a very important role to play. Um, so making sure or ensuring that we're raising awareness among individuals of the age inclusive design features in our homes that will help ensure that our homes are sort of suitable for us, are the, the right place for us for the, over the course of our life, lifetime. Um, and of course, making or raising awareness of the associated um, costs of these features as well. In terms of access and accessibility, um, here investing in age-friendly communities would really help reduce some of these barriers. Um, so for example, by designing and investing in safe, accessible, reliable and affordable public transport, or by designing better last mile travel. Um, so we have made some progress in this, this area, but I think there's still a long way to go in terms of tackling this last mile hurdle. So how, how do we support people in getting from the car park or bus stop or underground station to their final destination, whether this is their place of work, uh, the shops, a museum, or wherever it is they want to go. Um, and this is one of the sort of, I think, key challenges in um, public transport at the moment. And the growth of recent um, sort of e-scooter and bike sharing schemes have helped address this to some extent. Um, but it's important to remember that, well, these schemes, they're not available in all cities and also they're not accessible to everyone. So it's really important that planners, when they're sort of designing, um, uh, designing the sort of public transport um, networks or sort of helping or designing the services to help people na navigate town, town centres, that they think about um, providing accessible micromobility options as well. So these could be things like um, trikes, for example, or mobility scooters. Um, another, I think, important issue here is to think about better integrating the different transport options available. So a better integration between public transport and these last mile travel options, um, embedding mobility as a service. So at the moment, if we want to plan a journey, we often have to rely on multiple platforms to look for 
train times, bus times, book tickets here. Um, I don't know, maybe sign up to an app to be able to sort of hire a bike somewhere else. Um, and this sort of makes the process of planning our travel a lot harder. So mobility as a service or the goal of mobility as a service is to provide a single platform. So a one stop shop where people can basically plan their door to door journey and often buy all the tickets that they would need for that journey. Um, and lastly, under access and accessibility, we feel that uh, we should be actively promoting the UK's network of age friendly communities. And the goal here is really to get to get councils and retailers and local groups to work together to reduce some of the physical and social barriers that individuals in their neighbourhoods, um, towns and cities face. Um, and finally, to enhance the shopping experience, um, I think designing a more inclusive experience, both off and online, um, would be extremely important. And this includes, for example, recognizing and rewarding accessible design, for example, by introducing a nationally recognized um, accessibility accreditation program that would encourage retailers to go above and beyond the minimal minimum, sorry, legal requirements when it comes to accessibility, and also to provide a platform for rewarding and celebrating good accessible design practice. So along the lines of the um, Blue Badge Awards that exist in the hospitality sector. We could also be thinking about making more use of augmented reality to enhance the in-store shopping experience. Um, and this could include things uh, like uh, creating apps so that people can use their smartphones or other handheld devices when they're walking around shops to scan products, to get more information about a particular product, or to find uh, complementary products, or find information on more affordable alternatives, for example. Um, and these systems could help make the in-store shopping experience more um, more enjoyable, more accessible, but it's important that these systems, of course, are designed um, in an inclusive, inclusive and accessible way. And lastly, we feel that uh, we could do more to explore emerging technologies to enhance the online shopping experience. So making use of, uh, say, virtual reality or metaverse technologies, for example, to create a truly immersive online shopping experience. Um, and this could provide a platform for uh, people who face significant barriers in getting to and around the shops. This will provide a platform for them to continue to benefit from or to enjoy some of the benefits of shopping. Um, and not just in terms of, you know, your online experience when you're browsing for products and making that more, I guess, sort of more realistic, more... Um, uh, well, more in line with, with our experience when we wander around shops, but there's also the potential to make this a social experience as well. So provide an opportunity for people in different parts of the country or even in different countries to come together in an online shop as they would um, in a sort of face-to-face -face environment. Um, so this is a sort of quick overview of the report. Um, it's been launched today um, and it's available on the ILC website. So if you'd like to um, find out more information about any of our findings then that's the place to go um, so thank you very much for listening and um, yeah, I look forward to the panel discussion next and I will stop sharing my screen that's great thank you so much Vivi it was so interesting and gives us so much to dig into for our, our panel uh, discussion now so what I'd like to do is um, have our panelists join us here and if you could please introduce yourselves to start that would be great we'll, we'll start with Chris and then Colin and David. Uh, hi everybody I'm Chris I am a senior research fellow at the Helen Hamlin Center for Design and I lead research in the Asian diversity research space and uh, for the Design Age Institute. Hi, my name is Colin Lowe. I'm director of the Design Age Institute here at the Royal College of Art in London. And um, I'm David Sinclair, the chief executive of the International Longevity Centre in the UK, the a specialist think tank on the impact of longevity on society. Thanks all. 
So I'll start off with a few questions for you to set the scene for us. So I think, David, I'll, I'll start by asking you, you know, at ILC, you've been doing research on spending and saving in later life for quite some time now. And I wondered if you could share your perspective on why this retirement consumption puzzle is, is such an important issue to address. I think on the one hand, there is this sort of um, perception in public policy and in the media that older older people are spending the kids' inheritance and you see these newspaper stories. And, and I think we really want to get to the bottom of how true that is. Um, why, why, why have we done the work? Actually, fundamentally, because it's really important for our economy and important for younger people as well as old. And at the simplest level, most of our wealth if most of our wealth is being held by older people and it isn't being used productively, we don't create demand in the economy, so we don't create jobs for all ages. Um, so, so I think there's an economic argument. And I think secondly, and perhaps we'll come back onto this later, how we use our, our money and our resources is really, really important to our well, well-being. And we've got to make sure that we maximise that. 100%. Yeah, definitely. I, 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 just, I love that idea of people can be criticised for spending their kids' inheritance as if it is their money. You know, you, you work all your life and you pay your taxes and you save a bit of money for your retirement. And then there's this expectation you don't spend it in your retirement, you hoard it to give to your kids. It's great when you can do that, <laughs> but surely you earn the money you get to spend it on your health and well-being in your later years. That, that should be the number one kind of rule. And Colin, I think I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with uh, with you on another question to tie in the design role in, in this equation. And I think we've discussed how sometimes design's role in overcoming barriers isn't that well understood um, societally. And why do you think then it's so important to help clarify this, how design does play a role in either creating the barrier or overcoming the barrier to these health benefiting experiences and goods and items that we would want? Well, I, th I think, you know, the design industry for the last 20, 30 years have been doing a very good job in trying to communicate what design is and where its benefits lie. Um, but I don't think it is still very well understood that you know, we take a very sort of universal view of design and that everything made by people has been designed by people. In other words, there was a problem that somebody thought up and they imagined a solution in their head and they built the solution and they used it, tested it. Therefore, everything that we've got has gone through some sort of design process. It's just most things in reality aren't very well designed. And it's and it's more true now than it's ever been because of the complexity of life. You know, it used to be I, you know, I designed a pair of shoes. I made a pair of shoes. I opened a shoe shop and people from the village would come and buy my shoes. Uh, and now it's, it's not good enough to design the shoe and put it on the shelf. You've got to design a way of getting people to the shelf to buy the shoe because uh, it's not easy anymore. And that whole journey hasn't been designed uh, just to shoot, or at least a lot of it's been thought because there's so many different parties involved in solving that problem. And it also, when I was when I was at college or, or just after graduating, design went through a very bad um, sort of brand reputation where everybody kind of said, it looks good, but it doesn't work. You know, like a designer watch or a designer car or a designer suit, you know, it looked good, but it didn't work very well. And in this, this demographic, we find it's the other way around. There's lots of things that work very well. They just don't look good. Nobody wants them. And I think we've forgotten that aspect of desirability again. That If you want people to adopt things, to use things, to do things, then they've got to be designed so they're desirable, so that people actually want to do the thing that you want them to do. Otherwise, adoption is always going to be impacted. And I think that's at kind of the heart of one of the things that we talk about. We talk about desirability, we talk about happiness, we talk about joy being a key motivator in the design process. And can I just come in with a very specific example? Ian, there's been a lot of stuff in the media over the last few weeks around the months, really, around the design. Like uh, the uh, perception that older people are being excluded by the move away from cash in car parks towards um, towards um, apps and um, things like that, and 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 of course, and there was a really interesting point made by Ashton Applewhite in our Green Gross lecture last last week that was frankly, it, if you it, when you um, go towards younger people and talk about talk about some of these things, they'll say this app is stupid, it doesn't work. Whereas when you say, sometimes say to older people, they'll say, well, oh, yeah, you know, I can't manage. That app it's really too complicated it's me that's the problem and the reality is the first is true that actually there is nothing intuitively wrong 
wrong with getting rid of cash. In fact, it makes complete sense in so many ways. But you've got to make sure you design the alternatives in the accessible and usable way. And we've complete and the failure to do that is what is what causes the problem. Yeah, 100%. My former boss from the MIT Age Lab, Joe Coughlin, used to say that the older group, older age group are the only users that we blame them for not being able to use the product rather than blaming the designer for not designing an intuitive. Well, I'd agree, but I think that it is a very human um, action that if you can't do the thing you want to do, and I remember with the A to Z again when I was younger, try, trying to get around London with the, the old A to Z and trying to get it to work, and used to blame yourself. Think, oh, what an idiot! I can't seem to understand where. Which, uh, and we're not. We do tend to blame ourselves first. But I think this younger generation are so used to bad digital products that they've learned to blame the bad digital product <laughs> rather than, you know, and I think they're right to blame the bad digital product. And that move is, I think, is a really helpful move to point at the things in the system as, okay, the human is part of the system, but it's really that the mass of other things as well that have been badly designed, you need to point at. I think as well, it's it's that idea of, of what you've grown up with, you know, so these the younger generation that have grown up with this are more likely to to not reflect on it as something unusual you know so the the, the blame isn't based on it being new it's they've grown up with this so they blame it on on bad design as they should it doesn't work the way it should but i think if you come to something that's less familiar there is a little less confidence around it and a, a little internalizing of where the blame sits but it absolutely does sit on on the design and the, the lack of understanding of of the needs you know uh that getting the design brief wrong because designers or, or whoever it may be have not brought in enough voices to understand the problem well enough but but i i, I think as as colin said as well though we have to make these the products and services desirable if you look at um the octopus card in Hong Kong, um, which is a payment card, really simple to use. Everyone uses it. Or WePay in China, which is basically, I was talking to someone about, so, well, you know, do older people use WePay and WeChat in China? And it's like, yeah, everyone uses it. And they use it because they like to talk to their grandchildren and they like to pay for things. And it's done in a really simple way. And I really think there's something about that you know that the the making sure the experience is what people want because frankly people aren't don't want the extra hassle but if you say well you can both pay with this and you can use to chat to your friends then you know isn't isn't that fantastic um and so i think we've got to really focus on what people actually might want yeah absolutely i think like inclusive inclusive design i think is about that access certainly but it's about elegance as well elegance of experience you know it works it's yeah, it's pleasurable. It's it does what it should do, and you you understand how it's making things better. Yeah, definitely. And I think that might be um, a nice transition into a little uh, report specific question. But that I'll start with with Vivi. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing some of the findings that you thought were particularly intuitive, and that uh, readers might be like, oh, that makes sense, and then others that may have surprised you or or um, been maybe something that we wouldn't expect to, to see come out of the, the research. Yes, of course. Um, I mean, I think the fact that the number one barrier had to do with financial concerns, whether that's being on a tight budget or worries about needing the money in the future, was perhaps not that surprising, um, particularly given the sort of current cost of living crisis. Um, but there were also some, I thought, quite interesting and maybe sort of counterintuitive findings um so in particular we or yeah we looked at the um how the sort of the prevalence of some of the barriers varied across age groups um because the people we were looking at so we looked at everyone aged um 60 and above of course within that there's a lot of diversity so we tried to break it down by age and some other characteristics um and it was interesting so as you'd expect people when we think about sort of access and accessibility barriers people who are older and people who reported um, worse, um, worse health were more likely to have difficulty getting or say they had difficulty getting to and around places. And that's probably not very surprising. What I found interesting was actually there were quite the numbers of younger respondents, so people in their early 60s and people who reported their health as good or excellent 
also, like quite a significant number of these respondents also reported these difficulties. Um, so that suggests to, to me that a lot of these access and accessibility barriers that we might think, okay, they make things difficult, they make things a lot harder for some people, but actually they make things difficult for everyone. And by addressing these barriers, we're, you know, we're not focusing on a particular group, we're sort of focusing on making things better for everyone. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah, I think that's quite powerful. It can help us make the case for having more inclusive design. I, I think to me, when I first came across this research and, and, and started reading into it in detail, it was it was this, this this simple statement that you know I've got enough stuff. You know, you kind of you, by the time you get to you know, your sixties and seventies, you know, you've kind of got one of everything. Um, and I was and, and I just hadn't thought about it like that because I was still thinking in that kind of 30, 40 year old mindset um, of, of, of a consumer and this idea that, well, if, if, if you want to sell me a toaster, you've got to give me a very good reason to get rid of the perfectly functioning toaster I've got in my house at the minute. And if you want me to buy some clothes, you've got to think of a very good reason why I'm going to throw out these these jeans that don't have holes in them. You know, I've got enough stuff. So either, and, and I just thought that was very interesting. We're try, just keeping, trying to keep selling people stuff that they've got is not a very good strategy for, for people in this demographic. Um, you're not targeting on what their needs are. And, and I think the slide that you showed, Vivian, with, uh, you know, you talk about, you know, the holidays and experiences, people buying experiences, social inclusion, social interaction, joy, happiness, things that add quality to their life rather than objects. Is, is it, you know, those two things combined, I think, is quite revelatory. I think as well, it's that, that's really interesting, Colm, I think, because I, I, I'm absolutely in that mindset myself. You know, I have to be very uh, well convinced if I buy something that I already have. So it's almost the the opportunity there is if something changes. So we were talking about, you know, these kind of smart cards and Ch Japan, China, Oyster cards and so on here. Um so recently my son got, and he's 11, a little wallet that you can instantly ping the cards up so you don't have to dig into the wallet. And my father saw it and he's in his 70s and he's like, that's brilliant. You know, so it's the change away from money in this instance, the sort of change of uh, the needs, the change of the experience. So he can easily press this button. The cards all display themselves. He takes that out easily. And he was inspired by an 11 year old's uh consumerism you know my 11 year old doesn't really need it but my father saw the the uh yeah the, the good design essentially the well-considered design how will people actually use this and, and david made a great point about banks and that change um you know you look at the monzo card which is you know kind of meant to be targeted it's, it's a challenger bank targeted a kind of youthful want to do things differently you go down to the pub and you look at the people who get them out of their wallet to pay in the pub with them. And I don't see a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of younger people using them, but there's a lot of everybody from every age group using them simply because it is a much more intuitive, usable interface, much simpler to understand and get the, just the bits of information that you want when you want it. Now, it still really uses people's second bank, I suppose necessarily perhaps to their first bank, but it's made huge inroads and it's not because it targeted the audience. It was just better designed. And I think because the report looks at what are the design opportunities and also the policy recommendations, I was wondering, Chris, if you might want to share some thoughts on the areas where you felt that these designs that help us and with what we want and need, um, and then the policy recommendations that, that Vivi had been sharing, and if there's moments where you see there's particularly a particular alignment, or if there's ever moments where you think that it may be at odds or, or needs more clarity about how they could better work together. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, lots of that within within the report. You know, I, I think policy, uh, policy making and and designing is is complex and and messy, and and often there are shared agendas, shared goals. But as Vivi was chatting, you know, I was writing down, you know, phrases and and, and issues she was pointing out, like lack of places to rest, cluttered spaces, you know, lack of toilet provision. Um, and I think this, this whole topic around spending time and money, you know, spending your resource in ways you want to not being able to, it seems to be a lot of it is about getting out and about navigating uh, places well. And that seems to be a lot about age-friendly infrastructure, you know, the housing, the buildings, the transportation, transportation systems. And I think policies 
are increasingly, you know, highlighting this and, and talking to age friendliness. But I think, yeah, there is conflicts around, um, I guess, economic economic growth, you know, what where the priority is, um, you know, the scale, the affordability. I think sometimes within cities, there's a tendency to try and attract younger cohorts. Um, so they try, you know, on, on one hand, there's um, a nudge towards age friendliness, but then the conflict is trying to bring in other cohorts where sometimes that age friendliness kind of falls off the radar a little. Um, so there, there's that kind of tension and, and maybe a challenge around how you translate policy when other all these other noises, all these other voices are coming in with the other priorities. Um, yeah, I think that that's what, what I was thinking as Vivi was chatting. Yeah, and David, I wonder because Alice has been making policy recommendations for quite some time. If you had any had any thoughts on how we can get that best alignment between the policy recommendation and the design opportunity that can come in with it, I, I think I think it's a it's it's it, 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 it's a it's a real real challenge, and and I think I think there is a. Um, uh, I, I think we've absolutely in, it, it made good progress in some some areas. I think one of the real challenges is we have no government or industry leadership on how we adapt society for longer lives. And we're we're going to be running a business summit in September to just try and pull some pull some people together. But I I think on the sort of the I suppose the 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 you know come, just come back on some of those other couple of points. And I know you just made the point about um sort of um you know, not encouraging spending for spending's sake. And I think we have to keep that 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 in the back of our or the front of mind, really. But I, I I think it is true that if we create the right products, people will buy them. So how do we create the Tom Tom effect? You know, you have a new product, journalists are talking about on BBC Breakfast, everyone uh, ultimately gets a sat nav in their in their car or actually on their bike or when they're walking walking now as we lose the lose the A to Z. Um, we need to recognise that we may want the um, that actually our, our needs may may not change very much, but we might not want the long haul flight. But and and if we do, we might want to splash out on lounge access. We need to think. I think you know I'm I'm much more positive. I think than column is generally much more, mm -hmm. but glass half full mm -hmm. around the the progress that people like Design Age Institute and Helen Hamlin Centre have made on inclusive design. I think we've made massive, massive steps forward in products, but actually we're miles away on services. So for example, where's the inclusively designed nighttime economy? Um, anyone who stayed in a hotel knows that it's getting worse and worse. So working out not just um um, how to not just how you make a you know making sure that your your bedroom has enough light but working out how to switch them on is just a complete nightmare now we've made what should be a really simple thing really complicated it's still the case 40 50 years on that you turn a shower on by putting your hand under cold water design has completely failed us in so many ways and and I think a bit of it is making the the economic case to business as well as to government. So and there's a question in the chat I saw about return on investment. Just get five immediately came to ha hand. Tesco's first website they had a separate disability site. They realised that the te separate disability site worked better than the other site, and they swapped them around. Um, made huge amounts of money. Google made web search easy compared to AOL. AOL disappeared, and Google took over the market. iPhones made high tech computers accessible and usable in a way you didn't ever have before. Sky made hardware and software accessible and ended up selling 10 million boxes in the UK. And Amazon created frustration-free packaging 15, 20 years ago and now dominate the online shopping market. I think we have huge economic evidence that if you do this well, you will get a return on investment. And I think what's amazing is not, you know, that there are still companies who don't get it. Yeah. Points, and I wondered too, and um, maybe maybe David could start, but if anyone else feel free to jump in on this question about in terms of that's that's you know if we can communicate better that economic evidence to industry that will help us a lot with getting the good uh, the better design products and services and environments out there. But in terms of expressing this message to the public audience, so that we as consumers might be sort of more equipped with. Um, what to call for, like what better design to call for, what to look for, or 
um, you know, just to know what our options are out there. I, I guess, how do you, in the, in the benefit that might come with that, how do you think we can communicate to individuals or, or more largely to society, the benefits of, of um, spending on, on things that could be good for our health? I think if you, I mean, I, I answer a bit of that. There's lots of different aspects to that question. about there's a policy aspect about, you know, why is the Equality Act not applied universally? Why, why is it selective about what it decides to be equal about? Um, but, but if you move away from the policy aspect and into sort of a market solution, I mean, as consumers, we have very little choice in reality. The only choice we've got is to vote with our wallets. You know, if, if Sainsbury's is awful, then go somewhere else. If it's not awful, then go there. If a shop, you know, looks after you better than another shop, you know, vote with your wallet. Uh, it's the same with social media. People complain about it all the time, about being evil in photographs and all, all the rest of it. Well, then don't use it, you know. But if you keep if you keep supporting things that don't work, then they will keep doing things that don't work. And I think that that supply and demand thing, you know, really got to be more focused on um, all of us. And, and of course, then we've got to talk about, you know, the ageism thing, you know, that word that we it's very loaded and difficult. But uh, and, and I, as a designer, was guilty of this. And I'm sure all designers at some point were guilty of this. You kind of designed in your own image. You know, you, the client just said, design us a shop. So we designed a shop. Uh, and you didn't think you, you didn't have the brief. You didn't have the budget. You didn't have the knowledge to design beyond that. And it, it probably wasn't forgivable in the 80s and 90s, but it's certainly not forgivable today. Um, just to design where you exclude a percentage of the population through ignorance. And particularly when that percentage of the population has, you know, the, the vast majority of, of the household spending uh, capability in the country. Yeah, 100%. And, and, and perhaps just, uh, just come back on the choice thing, because I think it's very, very relevant in terms of all of us. And there is a... There is a bit of a chicken and egg situation where you will have suppliers saying, well, older people don't change what products, so we won't won't market to them. And then people say, well, if you don't market to them, then people won't change their products. But but I, I think there is something about we probably all need less choice, um, but we need better choice. Um, and, and actually, we don't need 30,000 financial service products. We need to know. And, and Marks and Spencers, to be fair, have been great at this with their plan A. You know, if you go into Marks and Spencers, the idea is that if you buy eggs, they're always free range. If you buy clothes, they're always washable at 40 degrees. We need exactly the same in other sectors where instead of having thousands and thousands of products that we don't understand, we have a small number and we can trust them. You know, car insurance, holiday, travel insurance is just is one of the best examples here where you have these comparison websites, which are completely impossible for anyone to understand because they all include different things. And actually what you really want as a consumer is here is product A, you can trust this will get you back, give you health cover and look after your bags if you don't do it. And, and, and I think we're just we're actually making the world more complicated, not less as a as a way of distinguishing products between each other. And that is to the disadvantage of of all of us, because none of us, frankly, really wants to go through 400 pages of travel cover. And, and uh, uh, you know, this is again uh talking artist school a little bit from a previous job I had, but I used to be head of design at Homebase. And obviously our number one customer was B&Q. B&Q had all the purchasing power, where, you know, much bigger than Homebase. And they went on an everyday low price campaign. No messing about, no mucking, no 10% Fridays, no buy one, get one, just everyday low price. But we couldn't compete on that. So it was all smoke and mirrors. It's all 10% Fridays. And, you know, when it's gone, it's gone. And that sort of impulse purchase until the consumer was so confused, they didn't know what they were buying, quite frankly. Yeah. And, and all those impulse purchases would therefore fly off the shelves, not realizing they were paying high margins. You know, and, and it's a bit nice, but that was it. It's the difference. And, and I'm absolutely with David that, you know, we've got to look at that and just go for good products and services. And once we've worked out who they are, we should support them and we should not support people who are not offering good products and services. But it's not easy. You know, marketeers and, and advertising agencies and clients have had decades worth of understanding how to tap in to, to the human psyche to, to sell, sell us things. It's, that, it's definitely that glut of, of options, you know, when you were talking about the, the shoemaker come to my you know, come to my shoe stall or whatever, you know, 
now if you look for shoes where, where do you begin you know it's that drinking from a fire hydrant or whatever you know it's just like so much so much so I think clarity and in, in communication around you know what is good inclusive age friendly I don't know if that's accreditation or it's some kind of carrot or stick you know I mean I think speak with your wallet absolutely but it's kind of easier said than done when you know all the people you're chatting about call them you know the, the marketers and uh you know these different strategies around uh showing you stuff that you maybe don't need but being convinced that you do so it's like i think we need that that sort of that beacon or, or that that trust you know that that seems a difficult nut to to crack but that seems important here to to have confidence that you're you're being shown what is the best you know what is good design what is it accessible will it give me pleasure is the experience as good as it should be and trying to get past that noise that that's the difficulty and, and that's assuming you have choice you know if you if you live in a rural rural uh, area and you have one supermarket that's your choice <laughs> you know you've got one supermarket um, so sometimes it's just not possible um, and then we've all got to do that very un-British thing and complain you know, if something's not right, you need to say something about it. It is, and it's difficult. You know, we're not very good at it, apparently, in this country. Although well, there's different research says different things on that, but, but yeah, you do have to make your 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 views heard. But yeah, I think on that point, um, to you, Chris, about that rewarding or, or you know helping us highlight what good design looks like. It goes to Vivi's point in the report about that we can reward accessibility and and kind of help signpost to where it is, where it has been done well. And, mm. and Vivi, that, that sort of draws me to ask you if, if there are other key messages, like for you personally, that stood out to you in the reports that, in the report that you hope come across? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think the key thing, and perhaps unsurprisingly, when we're looking at these barriers, they are complicated, uh, they are often interconnected. Um, and I think when we think about how we're going to address them, we need to, to do this successfully. I think we need to get people from different backgrounds, from different fields working together. Um, and also making sure that we're listening to individuals. Um, so I hate the expression evidence-based policy and evidence-based, not because I disagree with it, but because I feel that that's what we should be doing all the time. We shouldn't need to say evidence-based this, that's, um, yeah, and I think otherwise we do run the risk of sort of design, either designing projects or devising policies that aren't addressing, you know, they're addressing a perceived problem or challenge rather than a real problem or challenge. Yeah. But perhaps, and perhaps just to, just to come back on that, I think a really, really good, really good point. Now, clearly, government um, and you know think tanks occasionally, and 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 others sort of do the opposite. Sort of um, instead of evidence based policy, it's policies based evidence. So we basically, or it's the other way around, that we basically look for the look for the evidence that supports our policy rather than uh, rather than the other way around. I think we, you know, one thing you know, we 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 need to be really cautious of in the in the whole discussion around the the listening to people is that lots of people in marketing industry say why the hell would we listen to our customers and they're sort of right in that you know the and I always come back to that forward quote of you know if um if you ask me about sort of what um you know in terms of the future of mobility people would have asked for a faster horse rather than a car and, and I think there is something around designers have a responsibility but that doesn't mean you always have to listen to exactly what 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 people are saying and and what we know is that people will say what they think based on their current knowledge and experience and the and design has to change our lives you've got such an important job here and such an exciting job here the reality is our, our world and our products and our services are changing we we just need to make sure that we we take people along with us if you go to places like israel you know come let come back to where i started you know the whole car parking app they have a single car parking app that works across the whole of the country you press the button and turn it on and drive wherever you want you don't have to worry about it they people have been taken along a journey and people and there would be no sense of this is this is crazy this is impossible to use so i think there's just something about us um you know yes yes i, I, I shouldn't be too negative about listen yes listen but actually we have to lead as well i, I i'd like to, i agree i guess there is definitely a point where the, the designer or the policymaker, or whoever it may be, has to 
make decisions based on you know their insights so their maybe their access to new technology things that might not be out there um but I, th I think they have to be as well informed as possible which is why i think they have to listen like ford equally said you can have any color you want as long as it's black you know so there's there, that power sometimes can be misused so i think if people understand and if people are on this the same page have the same agenda around age friendliness then yes absolutely at some point they have to make that decision but yeah it, it, it's um a position of of, of privilege or power or influence and, and it has to be used the right way and ideally by thinking about the, the kind of diversity of need out there and older people not being a homogenous group no stereotypes you know so that's why i think listening is so important I agree. I think um, this might be a good moment to bring in some of the audience questions that are coming through. And the, the first one that I'm seeing here on the list, it goes back to a, a point you made, Colm, earlier about question, whether we have choice and your sort of reference in the maybe if we're living more remotely, we might only have one grocery store. So this, this question is, what do the panel see as the key challenges in relation to removing barriers for the rural? for older people who live in rural areas over and above the, the question of the public transport provision. Yeah, I think that came from Keith Binding. Hi, Keith. Thanks for that. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots of challenge, really. I mean, transport is one and the diminishing services in the high street. You know, particularly if you're you, you, you used to on your high street having one bank, one post office, one grocers, one whatever, they're all kind of disappearing. And that means that you have to travel to get the things you want or you have to go online, neither of which are, are, are good experience on the whole as yet um, in those areas. And I think that comes from a policy and investment perspective. Um, either that or we redesign transport, which is something we're looking at at the minute at, at, at the Design Age Institute, you know, where we've got... Um, innovation projects in the transport space and the mobility space currently, but it's uh, it's a very that those are the ones that are very very big questions that involve not just design but the whole the whole of government and the whole of society. Uh, and perhaps I you know now that we call my sort of my the, the I suppose that I think design can make rural living much more accessible and it can make um, villages better. It can, you know, there is a, there is a, a, a very, very significant role. And, and of course, one of the challenges you have is many rural areas haven't changed for a hundred years and that is the joy of them. But that is also what contributes them to being not very accessible in the same way that, you know, places like London has, you know, a, a lot of the buildings we have are the same buildings we had two, three, 300 years ago. So it's very hard to make them accessible. So we have to be conscious just that particularly in the UK um I I think one thing you know living in rural areas is an amazing thing and this is where I'm going to get into trouble I do think though we need to be honest with um with all of us around for example the reality is that you know there are fewer services in rural areas and actually if you are physically particularly if you're physically moving yourself from an urban to a rural area at the point at which you need rural services um i think there's a real i think there is a real issue that actually we're not honest to older people and say are you really sure you want to do this because actually uh, and it will work for some people but we know that people move away from their communities they move into places where there just aren't the services so so yeah so and i think design can partly answer that problem but not but not completely and i think we just need to be a bit more honest with people about you know the benefits yes but actually the challenges of rural living because they're undoubtedly huge ones that design are not going is not going to solve and i think some of the challenges okay you know that the, the provision of groceries and, and all those things they, they can be solved and are being solved digitally. They're not 100% great at the minute, but, you know, compared to where they were 10 years ago, if you think five or 10 years into the future, if there's the same sort of leap in service development, then they're going to be great. What seems, but the, the loss of all those sort of post offices and banks and, and things results in uh, a lack of opportunity to interact socially. And somewhere that's the thing that design can do. How do you reimagine rural locations that they are opportunities for people to meet and talk and chat and get to know each other, share and support each other? Um, because the one thing that an app can't do, it cannot bring you a cup of sugar or give you a hug. Um, and those things, as we've all learned three years ago, are hugely important. Um, so how can design and, and what is design's role in helping to reimagine uh, those and create those connections in a community a lot of the rest can come to us digitally. 
Mm. I think like as well, coming from a rural area um, and, and my family, you know, going back to grandparents coming from an even more rural uh, area, I, I definitely see the challenges. So I think, David, that that um, honesty um, and, you know, the sort of notion of communicating what the experience will be like, the, the highs and the lows, it, it, it's idyllic sounding to move lockside and be sat in front of a fire reading a book. But then if you have a, you know, catastrophic fall and, you know, split your hip into and there's no hospitals in the area anymore. And even the local clinics have long gone, you know, due to uh, lack of resource, lack of money. That's a massive challenge that, um, yeah, the, the rural, that's the trade off that that rural setting um, it, it, that's part of the character of it now, but equally, Colm, you know, I think that there's loads that can be done um, and there is a lot that digital can cover. Uh, but yeah, I think the honesty is an interesting point, David. I think that, that I think that's really important. We've seen it in our research time and time again, people moving to rural areas without fully understanding, you know, as time goes on, how their experience will change. But I do think also we have to think at the full life course, you know, I've got to the age now where you're thinking about, you know, what does retirement look like? What are you doing? going to do? And this idea that, right, I've hit 60 or 65, I'm retiring and I'm going to either stay in the house I'm in or buy my, you know, rose covered thatched cottage in the middle of the countryside. And, you know, in my head, that isn't a wise thing. That's not the way you think about it. You think about, right, I'm soon I'll be 60. I'm going to spend 10 years doing this, then 10 years doing that. Then by that stage, by the time I hit 75, I'd better be back in a city near a hospital, near my GP, near my family, near my children. <laughs> you know, you know, so it's not this idea that you retire and that's it for the rest of your life. I think, you know, because your needs change. Why would you not change where you live based on the needs that you have at that time? And at the age of 60, 65, yes, I want to just get out of London and have, you know, a cottage, or, or, you know, on a mountain somewhere or on a beach somewhere. But once I get to 70, 75, nope, then suddenly it's social interaction and back in where there, where there are services and facilities. And I just want to say one thing, um, Oliver Chan has been very active on, on the Q&A, and I just want to, he, he did not, yeah, I don't think Oliver, you asked a question as such, but you did want to sort of signpost this to things like the Chatty Calf Scheme, Camarado's, Birthday Project and Happy to Talk Benches, which I think, well, I'll certainly check out. So thanks for posting us to them. Um, so thanks. Thanks. And thanks for everyone to the questions that have been coming through. I think we might have time for one more here and then um, we can follow up when we make a post about this. We can touch on some of the questions we weren't able to respond to in person today. Um, but Cameron Waldron asks, if he, or he says there, are, there appears to be a common issue of agency of the older population. And the question is, Perhaps design should also focus on how to improve the power and agency of individuals. Are we ignoring the self-efficacy resources of individuals? Yeah, well, that, but this taps into something, you know, that uh, Carly, you and I, we talk about quite a lot, and, and, and Chris here, this idea of wisdom, this idea that, you know, that sort of graph that talks about ability as one ages, you know, um, is, is, is kind of well known. But, you know, in the same way that um, you know, I bought every, I one of everything I need, but it was also true as I've, I bought it ten times already. You know, so I, I've learned how to buy trousers and forks and chairs and whatever. And that can, wisdom, that canny consumerism, you know, that agency, that learning how to do something, that increase in wisdom as you age, uh, I think is something that's not talked about a lot. And how that, how a designer can respond to somebody. Who has, if you're trying to sell me a pair of jeans, well, remember, I have bought 30 pairs of jeans in my life. You know, if you tell me that skinny jeans are going to make me more sexy at, you know, at 56, I'm going to tell you you're confused. Um, so, so how do you tap into that lifetime worth of experiences um, and that agency that comes with that? How do you leverage that? I think could be really powerful. Uh, and I, th I think the other thing around sort of, an agency is is recognizing that our own perceptions of aging aren't necessarily the perceptions of 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 everyone and and also letting people make mistakes you know one of the really interesting things that we did a piece of work on dementia and spending recently and one of our core sort of principles was we're not here to stop people with dementia buying stuff and frankly we all buy stupid things and that actually we should not be in a place where we're trying to over protect people and you let them make 
the sex. And one of the really fascinating things that came out from that was people with dementia we spoke to, and indeed businesses, said that, you know what, cards, paying using cards, using prepaid cards or debit cards is so much better than cash for people with dementia. Because basically, they don't have to worry about change. They don't have to worry about, and there's some, and yet, actually, there is often a we know better for people. And I think we've got to recognize that actually, there, that, you know, that actually, that there could be some really, really interesting design led solutions to some of these problems. But actually, and I, let me be a bit softer on my don't listen to people, you know, actually, you know, let's let people make mistakes. Let's let people actually consume to enhance well being. And then my final point was a bit just this, you know, why I think it's, this is really important, why we care about it is because, um, and there is a bit of ageism in talking about, you know, different generations wanting and needing different things, but but actually our needs and wants at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy don't change. We all have a need for food and ship shelter. We might just want it to look a little bit different. At the top, we all have the same needs. We have the same need for actual self-actualization. In between those, we might want to spend a bit less on clothes and work travel when we stop working and a bit more on holidays and leisure. But actually, we all want to have fun. We all want social connections. Age is pretty irrelevant to that. And I think the challenge and opportunity for the design community is, is how you how you deliver that rather complex but conflicting opportunity. I think that's a perfect note to end on there, David. I want to thank all the panelists for joining us today. And a big thank you to the audience for, for listening in and for sharing your questions that we'll follow up on. And please check out the report on our websites and uh, we'll have further exploration on this topic going forward as well. So look forward to hopefully seeing you again. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.